Does anybody else here like trains? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I hoped you would. Uh, so I've got some pretty good news for you, and I hope to get everybody else excited by the end of this talk as well. Um, there's, there's a lot going on uh, in the world of trains right now. Um, after you know a century or so of neglect, American passenger rail is kind of on the upswing. Uh, there's new investment flowing from the infrastructure law that passed a few years ago. More and more people know that other countries around the world have great train systems. People are talking about trains as a climate solution. That's a nice segue from David's talk uh, just a moment ago. Um, and when people talk about trains, the topic of high-speed rail often comes up. Uh, which is great, uh, but the thing is that people tend to mean different things when they when they talk about high-speed rail, and also, depending on how we talk about it, we can have different things. We can have higher levels of service, uh, and so we're going to talk today a little bit about what exactly high-speed rail is, the progress that we're making, and uh, if you just can't wait, uh, you know where you can ride it and and when. Uh, the organization, I work for an organization, uh, a nonprofit organization, a uh, national nonprofit called the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, we have a few simple aims, which are to be the best source of information about what high speed rail in particular is, uh, the benefits that it can bring, and how to achieve it. Uh, we have our main office in Chicago, but I get to do my work as deputy director of the Alliance from here in Madison, working remotely. And the next slide brings us to Wisconsin, where, <laughs> all right, <laughs> I was going to ask if people know the history here. It sounds like most of you do, uh, just in case anyone doesn't. Uh, we could have had passenger trains running to Madison already for about 10 years, if not for this guy, uh, former Governor Scott Walker. Uh, we had, you know, thanks to the Obama stimulus uh, bill in, in, you know, about 2009 or so, uh, Madison, or Wisconsin actually got $810 million to build the passenger train uh, connection from Milwaukee to Madison, eventually on to the Twin Cities. Scott Walker ran, his gubernatorial, ran a gubernatorial campaign that included a strong opposition to this train. And unfortunately uh, for us, uh, we, we didn't get that train. You know, he won narrowly. Uh, and the project was canceled, the contracts were torn up, the trains were sent to, you know, we actually, Wisconsin actually bought the trains and had to send them away. We paid $60 million in legal fees. It's just a complete mess. Um, but um, nonetheless, uh, Scott Walker is, uh, is, is still uh, patting himself on the back for doing this. I found this on his, on his Instagram <laughs> account just four months ago saying, taxpayers sure are lucky that he killed it. When, when you do the drive between Madison and Milwaukee, do you feel lucky that there's no option for a train? I don't. <laughs> it's awful. It's stressful. It's aggravating. It's dangerous sometimes. We should have a train. Um, so uh, Scott is, uh, you know, for whatever reason, is, is still happy that he, that he, uh, that he stopped it. Um, but um, the, the funny thing is that what he stopped was actually not high-speed rail. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of the, the, the critics of, of the, uh, you know, what Wisconsin had at that point, one of the criticisms that they made was that it was going to be too slow. Now, I, I think that those arguments were not made in good faith. I don't remember anybody saying we shouldn't build that. We should build something much better. They were just saying don't build anything at all. So, you know, uh, take it with that grain of salt. Um, but let's, let's talk about uh, exactly what this high-speed rail is. This photo from a nice uh, sunny scene in Italy showing one of their excellent high-speed trains really kind of captures the essence of, of what we consider to be high-speed rail. There are a few key characteristics. Uh, one, you know, kind of starting uh, in the back on the, on the left is that there are no highway crossings. We call it a, a sealed corridor so that there's, you know, essentially no chance that the train is going to collide with a car or a truck or something like that crossing the road. Uh, High-speed lines should also have fencing to keep animals off the track. Uh, over there on the right, this is very important, uh, we separate uh, high-speed trains from freight trains. In the United States, if you've ever ridden Amtrak or you know, just seen the trains, uh, most of our uh, passenger trains in the U.S. share lines or sh share the same lines that freight trains use, which creates a number of problems, one of which is that you'll often end up with passenger trains full of people in a hurry to get somewhere. Uh, stuck behind slow trains full of logs or coal or something like that. So in high-speed rail, you, uh, you eliminate that possibility. 
Uh, High-speed track, you know, sort of technically uh, there are some things that you can and can't do. Uh, the tracks tend to be, you know, sort of rigid and optimized. You can't, at high speed, you can't take uh, sharp curves, of course. And then, you know, one of the, one of the key characteristics is also that high-speed trains are electrified. Uh, when a train doesn't need to carry all the weight of its own fuel, it can be lighter and faster. Uh, that's a, a key difference. And also, uh, as we, uh, well, when trains are electrified, they can be powered by renewable energy, uh, which helps with the, uh, with the climate crisis that we've uh, been talking about tonight. And all of these things together uh, make really high speed possible. Uh, the, there's, there's not really an official definition for exactly what high speed rail is. One of the common ones uh, internationally is uh, to consider 300 kilometers an hour uh, to be high speed rail. Uh, that works out to 186 miles an hour, very fast. Um, but uh, you know, there are uh, you know, systems that have these characteristics in countries all over the world running every day uh, that run at a range of speeds between about 160 and 250 miles per hour. Uh, we don't have any of that uh, in the United States yet, but we're getting there. Um, so let's move along. When you build a, a high-speed rail system with those characteristics, one of the main things, one of the main advantages is that it can save a lot of time. Uh, this chart shows, uh, you know, uses as an example, or uses an example from here in the Midwest. Between Chicago and St. Paul is almost exactly 400 miles, and uh, a, a, tr a true high-speed rate or a, a true high-speed train, rather, running you know around 200 miles an hour, uh, can cover that you know with the stops and everything in about a little over three hours. Uh, that's really competitive with flying when you factor in the time it takes to get to and from a far flung airport as they often are in most cities. Um, and then of course it's, it's a lot faster than driving, which takes about seven and a half hours. And another advantage in addition to it just taking less time overall is that on the train, that green bar in the middle shows uh, productive time essentially. Uh, you know, you can work on the train, you can read, you can watch a movie, you can do whatever you want to do. You don't have to be driving, you don't have to like stow your laptop for takeoff and landing, all, all that stuff. Um, so trains offer time advantages. Uh, they also produce a lot less carbon pollution, especially electrified trains. Um, there's, you know, other than walking and biking, there's basically no form of transportation that's as energy efficient as uh, trains, steel wheels on steel rail, uh, really eliminate friction. And uh, as this chart shows, they just produce a lot less carbon pollution than uh, the competition, both flying and, uh, and highway travel. So that's a huge advantage. Uh, High-speed trains are also really cost-effective. Uh, they, uh, they get singled out for criticism because, yes, they do cost uh, a lot of money uh, up front to, to build these systems, but so do our highways. Uh, there is a, uh, a high-speed rail project at an early stage of development in the Pacific Northwest called Cascadia. And uh, it's estimated that uh, the one track or, you know, one track on this line will carry as many, uh, you know, can, will have the same volume, will be able to move the same volume as 10 highway lanes. Uh, the estimated uh, cost for that uh, Cascadia system is about $42 billion, which is a lot of money. Um, but just adding two, line, two lanes, rather, to the interstate uh, in the, you know, in the same region, uh, is going to cost around $108 billion just for two lanes. And we do this all the time in the United States. We're doing this in Wisconsin. Uh, next year, I think the construction starts just to add two lanes to uh, I-94 on the west side of Milwaukee is going to cost like $1.7 billion, more than twice as much as, uh, you know, the, the amount that Scott Walker thought was too much. Uh, it's really, <laughs> it's really, uh, it's really cost effective to build high-speed trains. Um, and uh, it's a really proven technology. Uh, the, the first high-speed trains, or bullet trains, as they're often called in, in Japan, uh, rolled out uh, 60 years ago. The, uh, the 60th anniversary is, uh, is coming up uh, just uh, in, a, in a month or two, I believe. And uh, the, you know, there's a picture now, this is a modern version of, of uh, uh, you know, Japan's pioneering train uh, called the Shinkansen. Um, they now have these trains you know, going all over the country um, at around 200 miles an hour again. Um, in, in fairness, uh, we need to talk about safety. Now in Japan, you know, they have uh, these trains running all over the country, running, you know, 200 miles an hour, and there has been uh, an astounding number of passenger fatalities. That number is zero <laughs> in 60 years. <laughs> now, 
I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> Maybe I just did. <laughs> um, but I mean, and you know, in, in, in all seriousness, I mean, think about you know how many how many plane crashes have happened around the world in the last 60 years. In the United States alone, 40,000 people a year roughly die on our roads. You know, there, there's there's just no comparison. The the level of safety here on on high speed rail systems is just really extraordinary. So that's another huge advantage. Um, moving along. Um, Building a, you know, a really great system like some countries have already is going to take time. This map shows a, a few different things. The, uh, the darker blue lines, if you can see those, show current Amtrak routes. We have a kind of national train network, but it's, it's pretty skeletal. Most of those lines, if you're not familiar with them, just have one train a day uh, running on them in each direction, some not even that. Uh, so uh, you know, it covers a lot of territory, but it's still far from ideal. Uh, the infrastructure law, the bipartisan infrastructure law, though, that passed uh, almost three years ago, um, is putting $66 billion into passenger trains, uh, which is not nearly enough, um, but it's more than ever before. Uh, and so one of the things that the infrastructure law created was a program called the Corridor Identification and Development, or Corridor ID program. It's run by the, the Federal Railroad Administration, part of the US DOT. And uh, just last December, uh, the, uh, the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, gave out the first round of 69 uh, plan or grants, rather, for initial planning in 44 states to really start expanding and enhancing the, the, tr the passenger train service that we have. Those light blue lines show uh, either new or improved services uh, that are in the, in the works right now, or at least being you know, taken, given a good look. Uh, so a pretty serious expansion of what we have. And then over here, um, I'm fighting a little, with, with, a little bit with the cord, um, but there are some green lines over in the West that I just want to say a little bit about. Um, they got some significant funding, $3 billion a piece from a, a kind of different pot of money. Um, but anyway, those are, there are now not one, but two actual high-speed lines under construction in here in the United States of America. Um, one of them is uh, the state of California is building a line from the Bay Area uh, down to uh, Los Angeles. They've got more than 100 miles of it under construction already. They got $3 billion in funding. Uh, it's just a part of the funding, but they got that uh, in, in December. And there's a private company. Um, have any of you heard of Brightline? Okay, a few. Um, th there's a private company called Brightline, um, which already has trains running in Florida. They're not quite high speed, but they're very nice. I have a slide showing them later. Um, but Brightline is building a true high-speed line uh, between Las Vegas and the LA area. Uh, they, um, they broke ground on it in April, and they want to have it up and running in time for the Olympics in Los Angeles. We're back to the Olympics um, in, in 2028. So, you know, that's just a few years away. And that is, uh, this is probably the high-speed rail feel-good photo of the year. This is from the, uh, the groundbreaking in, uh, in Las Vegas in April. My boss, our executive director, Rick Harnish, got to go. Um, and if you remember from American history, when we built the first transcontinental railroad, we built from the east, built from the west, and where they met, uh, they hammered a golden spike into the ground. And so these dignitaries here are pounding in these little, uh, these little golden spikes. Um, we think that, you know, so it's great that this line uh, and the California one are under construction. It's going to be transformational when people can actually see this in our own country. Uh, you know, when your aunt and uncle start coming back from Vegas and saying, you know, oh, there's this amazing train. Why don't we have this here? That's going to be, uh, you know, that's going to be uh, uh, hugely helpful. Let's, let's come back to Wisconsin. Um, we don't have, uh, you know, we're not in line for actual, you know, sort of true high-speed rail yet, um, but Wisconsin did get several of those corridor ID grants. And so um, WSDOT, our, our Department of Transportation, is taking a look at several, uh, several new lines and improvements to existing service. They're looking at running more trains between Milwaukee and Chicago. We already have one of the most successful Amtrak routes in the country right there. Um, they're looking at uh, running trains up from Milwaukee to Green Bay through the Fox Cities, over to Madison, and then from Madison to the Twin Cities uh, through cities like Eau Claire. Um, we're talking about, um, you know, sort of a, a modest start, maybe four to six trains a day at, at uh, speeds of 79 miles an hour. Uh, so not as fast as the trains, uh, you know, that, uh, that we talked about a little bit earlier, but still much better than uh, having no trains at all. Uh, so this is in the works. 
Um, but looking to the future, that is, that is not the last word, uh, at, at least, you know, we don't want it to be. Um, and this, this diagram, which looks like a, you know, moderate piece of modern art or a molecule or something like that, um, comes from the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, they have done a number of studies for different regions of the country looking at, you know, what we really need uh, by maybe the middle of the century. And uh, they did a study, and this did not uh, happen under Joe Biden, or at least it didn't start under Joe Biden. They did this, you know, they worked on this for several years and only released it in the fall of 2021. They released a study called the Midwest Regional Rail Plan, and this is sort of the essence of it. They looked at a 12-state region and said, you know, what kind of train service do we really need? And it goes so far beyond anything that we have now. It's, it's amazing. Uh, they're talking about, you know, on the, the teal and the, the red line, 16 round trips a day, uh, except maybe on the Northeast Corridor. We don't have anything like that in, in the United States. Um, well, Florida, uh, Bright Line, I'll get to that later. Um, but the good news for us in Madison is that the line that they thought was the most important and has the most in potential is the one from Chicago to the Twin Cities via Milwaukee and Madison. 24 round trips a day, basically hourly service. Uh, and they say, you know, the trip time should be very fast. It should be about three hours. Uh, so just, you know, imagine what that could do if you could get on a train and be in the Twin Cities in, you know, a couple of hours or Chicago in a little, a little over an hour. That would, uh, that would take a lot of, uh, you know, you would need a pretty good reason to drive instead of taking the train. And a lot of people would, uh, would take the train instead of flying. This map uh, kind of shows that in a, in a different way. Uh, each uh, different uh, shade of color shows about an hour of travel time. And so depending on, you know, where you might be interested in going to or from, you can kind of figure it out. So, you know, from Madison to the Twin Cities, you know, two hours or so. From Madison all the way over to Detroit, maybe three hours. Madison to Indianapolis, three hours. Uh, again, you know, this would be much faster than driving. It would be flight competitive. It would be incredibly energy efficient, safe, all those other good things. Uh, as in, how, how do we get there? Um, our organization has a few top objectives. Uh, the, the first is to establish a national railway program. Uh, much like the interstate highway system took several decades to build and, and cost hundreds of billions in today's dollars, uh, building a really great modern train system for the, throughout the United States is going to take a, a pretty significant uh, commitment and, and steady, dependable funding. So that's priority number one. Uh, another one is that we want to get at least one true high-speed uh, line up and running somewhere in the U.S., Brightline uh, that project that I showed or told you a little bit about before is probably going to be the winner there. And then we, we think that investment in the Chicago hub is really important uh, for fa to establish fast, frequent service uh, to neighboring states like Wisconsin. Just going back to this map, you can see how Chicago, and this is actually true for pretty much all of North America, Chicago is kind of the rail hub for uh, the whole continent in, in a lot of ways, or at least a lot of it. So investments in Chicago's capacity pay off uh, and, and benefit hundreds of communities all over the country. Um, and in, in terms of creating that national railway program, you know, we're, we're not, we're certainly not there yet, but there are, we have champions in Congress right now. Uh, earlier this year, two members of Congress with a couple dozen co-sponsors introduced a piece of legislation called the American High Speed Rail Act, uh, which would put $205 billion over five years into developing high speed, uh, American high speed rail lines. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, that is something that is uh, at least under consideration right now. And uh, another, uh, another great leader in, uh, in Congress right now is uh, Congressman Mike Quigley from the state of Illinois. Uh, who uh, just in, in May, he published this terrific op-ed in the Chicago Tribune saying that we need to invest in high-speed rail for our future. Uh, Congressman Quigley right now serves on a very important transportation committee in Congress, and depending on what happens in the November election, he could be in, a, in, in an even more powerful position. So we have champions in Congress and need to keep that momentum going. So that's kind of the, you know, the lay of the land uh, politically and, you know, sort of... Uh, you know, in terms of what high-speed rail is, if you just can't wait to ride it, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. There are, there are options. 
Um, now, you know, to, to experience those, those sort of true high-speed rail systems, you do have to go outside of the United States. And you can take your pick. You know, this is not a, a complete list of all of them, but, you know, China has an incredible high-speed rail system. France has a great one. Japan, Morocco, Spain, Korea, Italy, Germany, there are others. Uh, you know, if you ever have the chance, or have maybe already, some of you already have, uh, you know, these countries have, have really terrific rail systems, um, and there are more and more all the time. Um, here, uh, closer, much closer to home, um, if you just want to ride a train, uh, you know, of course, we don't have them in Madison yet, although Madison is certainly working on it. Um, this, uh, this shows, a, if you go to Milwaukee, though, you can ride the, that train between Milwaukee and Chicago. It's called the Hiawatha. Uh, they just got some new cars. This shows one of them. Uh, it's, you know, it's a very nice, uh, convenient service. It takes about an hour and a half between Milwaukee and Chicago, runs seven times a day. Uh, if you don't want to go to Milwaukee, uh, this is a little closer to Madison. Um, the town of Columbus, uh, I don't, or, I mean, it's, it's, it's odd and frustrating that Columbus, which has a population of 5,000 people, <laughs> has a train and Madison does not, but uh, that's how it sort of worked out historically. Um, uh, Columbus, you know, you can get there in about a half an hour from Madison and has this kind of little old timey train station. Um, it's, you know, simple, but, but pretty nice. There are two trains a day uh, in each direction that go through there. One is a long distance uh, Amtrak train called the Empire Builder, which goes all the way to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, that lounge car with the, with the nice windows is, is on that Amtrak, uh, that long distance train. And just as of a couple of months ago, there's a, a brand new train called the Borealis, which only runs between the Twin Cities and Chicago through Columbus. Uh, here it is looking all spiffy on its very first day uh, at the end of May. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not fast. Uh, it, it takes about seven and a half hours uh, to, to make that trip. But it is already a huge success. This train uh, is, is selling out. Uh, it is making a profit. <laughs> Take that, Scott Walker. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and you know, they're already talking about adding more frequency to this line. So, you know, this is this is a good sign for Madison for a train like this to be doing so well. You know, just sort of so close, so 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 close to Madison. Uh, you know, this is this is helping to make the case that if we brought Madison into the system, think of how many people would would ride it. It would be terrific. Um, also, uh, some states, some of our neighboring states are a, a bit further along than we are. Uh, Michigan has trains now on the line between Chicago and Detroit that can reach speeds of up to 110 miles an hour. And as of last summer, uh, Illinois has one as well. The trains, you know, they don't go this fast the whole way, but uh, their line, they upgraded their line between Chicago and St. Louis and it can reach speeds of 110 miles an hour. Uh, Brightline, the company that is building the, uh, the line between Las Vegas and LA, they already have uh, service up and running in Florida. Uh, I believe its top speed is going to be about 125 miles an hour. They're working toward that. Uh, but they already have essentially hourly service between Miami and Orlando. Frequency, in addition to speed, is really important. And they have these nice modern looking trains. Uh, so, you know, if you ever have a reason to be in Florida, this is another uh, way to get a kind of taste of, of what's coming. And then on the, uh, the east coast of the United States for about 20 years or so, Amtrak has had a train called the Acela, uh, which, uh, which runs between Boston and Washington, D.C. for anyone who might not have had a chance to, uh, to ride it yet. This is actually the fastest train in service in the United States right now. Uh, it, it can only reach this speed uh, for a small portion of the journey, but it can travel up to 150 miles an hour. Um, because I'm a nerd, uh, I have a little app on my phone that lets me, you know, check the speed. Um, and uh, last summer I was running it and I clocked it at 156 miles an hour, which might be unlawful. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe the app is just, you know, a little off. I don't know how accurate they are. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have a need for speed, that's another way you can sort of try this out uh, in the United States. Um, and then, you know... It, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to build anytime soon that we're going to build, you know, coast to coast high speed rail systems and you'll be, you know, flying across Wyoming at 200 miles an hour. That's, that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, however, uh, if we build lines where it makes the most sense and kind of knit them together, we could really build a pretty good network. And this actually comes from a transit research, this map comes from a transit research and a researcher named Alon Levy, who's taken a look at where it would probably make the most sense to build true high-speed lines in the United States, in the most populated 
populous region, regions of the country, um, some on the West Coast and Texas, and then, you know, that big connected section from the Midwest all the way to the East Coast and, and to Miami. Uh, this would also, you know, just give, just give us tremendous options, uh, great alternatives to, uh, to driving, uh, and would really replace a lot of flights. Uh, for, you know, if you want more information, um, here's, uh, you know, a web address about our vision for Wisconsin. There's my email address, uh, if you'd ever like to write. Um, but just to, you know, in, in conclusion, uh, the, the, the speed, the safety, and the energy efficiency of high-speed trains uh, can help us to save time, to save lives, and to save the planet. Uh, we absolutely need to make this uh, part of our transportation system. Uh, so we need to, we're back to voting again. Um, we need to vote. We need to let our elected officials at every level know uh, that we want this transportation, uh, that we want this transportation option and let's get there faster.